Hey everybody, are you ready to cook dinner together? I am super excited to share this with you. I had this idea a while ago that it would be fun to cook dinner as part of the Knit Ithaca retreat. And I have totally invited Lola to join us tonight or today or whatever, I guess where it's the afternoon right now. And I wanna cook something that uses mostly local ingredients and um, I feel like I'm on a cooking show right now. Like suddenly it's like Lola on Food Network. Let's do this. Um, I have some ingredients laid out on my kitchen counter for you. Many of them are local. Not all of them are. I um, haven't even told you what we're making yet. And we are making polenta cakes with a roasted butternut and red onion topping and then a bunch of different other little things to make it taste super yummy. Um, it's really easy to make. It's also super easy to riff on. So if you don't have the exact ingredients I have, you can just put an egg on your polenta cake and call it a day and you're gonna be happy and feel very satisfied. Um, so to start with, I have polenta that is actually grown and ground in Trumansburg, New York, where I live, which is kind of amazing. I actually think this corn might be grown in Newfield, which is a good 20 minutes away from me, but it is definitely milled in Trumansburg, and I bought it from a local restaurant supply place in Teaburg. And those of you in Knit Ithaca got a bag of this in your kits, and it was very heavy to carry into the house. My husband was definitely like, tell me again why you bought that much polenta. <laughs> and I was like, because I'm starting a cooking show, hon. Um, so this polenta is milled in a mill that also mil mills flours. So if you are gluten-free like celiac, you might not feel comfortable eating this polenta, but um, anybody else, you, it's probably gonna be fine for you. That's up to you. I just wanna make sure that you know that. Um, I also use a tiny bit of Redbird cider, um, Redbird Orchard cider um, that many of you might have bought some cider for our tasting Friday night of the retreat. I just use a little bit of this when I make the butternut squash, you don't have to. Um, I also, in the topping, use some pepitas. These are grown in Seneca Falls and um, roasted there. They're super yummy. They also have a maple one that's really good, but that was like too sweet for, for this recipe, I think. Butternut squash I got from my CSA. Red onions from my CSA. For those of you who don't know, a CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. My farm that I get um, all my veg from throughout the year, from like June through November. As the crow flies, like literally if we took a walk and went across these fields, we would be there very quickly, but there's no roads and a few streams. So I drive there and it takes me about four minutes, depending on how fast I drive or if there's a tractor between me and getting to the CSA, it's awesome. Um, at the CSA, a lot of the stuff I pick from a room and then you can actually go out in the fields and pick as well. Um, and then I use a little bit of sage. This is sage I actually grew in my garden. I dry all my sage um, or all my herbs in the window behind me over the sink. Um, you could also use ground sage or fresh sage from the grocery store, whatever you have available. And then like salt and pepper, a little milk if you wanna use that. You can also make the polenta cakes with water. Um, this vinegar is just for a drizzle on the top if you like that and I love Aleppo pepper and um, use it all the time on everything is just like a finishing touch. It's a hot pepper that is from Aleppo. I use a little bit of a crumble of this on the top of the polenta cakes and this goat cheese is actually from a farm that is about two or three miles away from here in Inner Lake in New York, so one town up. And those of you that came to Knit Ithaca, uh, probably the first year I think of Knit Ithaca, we went to Lively Run Farm. This farm has been doing an incredible job this year during the pandemic of taking in milk from other farms that were otherwise dumping it because they couldn't sell it and um, making cheese and then giving that cheese to food banks and people in need. Super impressed by them and they're, um, we basically always have a few logs of this in the fridge and I'll show you how I deal with it because these logs are a little annoying to like cut open and then have available to use. So I have a little trick for that. So let's jump right in and start to make the polenta for the cakes because that needs to chill and set up so we can cut out the cakes. Okay, you guys, it is time to make the polenta. I have my heat on high under my saucepan and I'm gonna add two cups of water and two cups of milk. 
if you are vegan or don't have any milk or have somebody in your house who just doesn't like milk, you can do this with four cups of any liquid you want. So like two cups of water, two cups of broth, four cups of broth, all water, totally up to you. I don't think I'd use apple juice for this. I would stick with something savory, not sweet. And I'm gonna bring that to a boil. So I've got my stove on high. And while that's happening, I'm just gonna grease a nine by nine pan because I am not a professional cooking show person. I don't actually have a nine by nine pan. This pan works out to nine by nine. The goal is you just don't want your pan to be too small because then your cakes will be very thick. And I'm just gonna pour olive oil into the bottom of this pan. I'm pretty generous with my olive oil. I like olive oil. This olive oil I didn't tell you guys about earlier. My um, one of my daughter's friend's moms is Greek and she started a company. She lives um, closer to Albany, I believe, than Ithaca. And um, her family is Greek and they have a cold extraction olive oil farm in Greece and she imports this. It's not the least expensive olive oil I've ever purchased, but it is the best olive oil I've ever purchased. So that's all I'm gonna say about the Furies. So good. Um, so I got my pan greased. I am bringing my liquid to a boil, and while that is all happening, Lola's gonna remember to open up her polenta bag. So you guys know about this from provisional cast-ons. I'm gonna unzip this chain that has sewn up this bag. I love opening bags with a chain like that. And um, I am ready, almost ready, to add one cup of polenta to my liquid. I just have to wait for it to boil. So let's wait for that, and I'll show you the next step. All right, so I know a watch pot never boils. It took this one a tiny bit to boil, but here we go. We're good and it is hot and I've turned down the heat a bit and I'm gonna do this in two half cups. You're gonna be adding one full cup of polenta and you wanna add it slowly. So if you add it all at once, you're gonna end up with big clumps and I'm just gonna whisk and I'm gonna pour at the same time and you wanna pour slowly. You don't have to be like too crazy about it, but you just don't want to dump it in there because then you'll end up with lumpy polenta. And who wants lumpy polenta? I don't. So that's the first half cup, and then I'm going to do a second half cup. Okay, so here goes the second cup, half, sorry, second half cup. So it's one cup total. And you can see I'm just gently adding it in a little at a time and whisking away. So it's okay if you don't whisk it constantly, you just don't want it to burn on the bottom. So whisking it every so often, or um, you know, if you need to walk away from a second, that's okay, but I wouldn't like go um, get distracted by something in another room. I'm not sure you can knit while you're doing this. I'm really sorry, I should have come up with a recipe that was like knit and cook. That would be an instant pot recipe. We'll do that next year. Um, so I'm just whisking this and it takes a little while to thicken. It's about, it could be like five to 10 minutes to get it really thick. And the goal is to have it almost pulling away from the bottom of your heavy saucepan. Um, and the goal is basically that you're evaporating some of the liquid and the corn is starting to expand all those cornmeal bits and they get all smooth and creamy and not so gritty. So this is when it's really important to keep stirring. You can see that it's getting quite thick and this is when you could burn the bottom or have it stick and you'll start to almost feel that on the bottom. And that is a sign that you are almost ready to pour out your polenta. But almost like the longer that you can do this for, the better your polenta cakes are gonna be because the less moisture they're gonna have in them, so the less they're gonna splatter when you go to fry them. I feel, has, have you guys ever checked out Cook's Illustrated before? They'll have like a recipe that's like five pages of like the science behind. So I did not write my recipe like that, but I, um, there are some reasons why you do what you do. Um, maybe I'll start a cooking show. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> we are almost there.
So you can see that um, we are pretty much ready to pour this. It's kind of holding a pattern in the bubbles and the bubbles have really changed their shape. And you can see it's kind of holding a bit of texture to it and it's getting, my hand is getting tired. So I'm gonna call this ready to pour. So now we are gonna pour the polenta into your greased pan and I just need to get rid of my whisk, which means I will dump it in the sink. And I'm gonna switch hands because I am right handed. And I grabbed a rubber spatula, as you can see. And here we go. You wanna just get out as much as you can. Some people will take a while doing this. Life is too short for me to like micromanage every bit of polenta out. And you basically know that you did your polenta thick enough if it's not coming all the way to the edges. I might've put a little too much olive oil in this, but I really love olive oil. It tastes so good. Okay, so once you have that done, let it cool down just like a minute or two so it's not steaming so much. If you want it to set faster, you can put it in your fridge or your freezer for a bit. You can cover it with saran wrap if you wanna do that. Um, if it's cold outside where you live, you can also just like put it out on your porch for a few minutes and that will help it set up. So whatever you need to do to chill it so that it gets firm and you can cut the cakes. But while it is chilling, we are gonna cut the veg and get those roasting. Okay, so polenta is chilling. Let's make the butternut squash and onion. This is super easy. You're not, I'm not gonna have you watch me cut up the whole butternut squash, but basically you wanna get your butternut squash into like a half inch cubes. And some of you might have experienced when you cut butternut squash that your hands get this like weird dermatitis on them. It's like kind of thick and waxy. It doesn't happen to everybody, but some people's skin reacts with the sap. You can almost like see the sap coming out of the butternut squash right now. So I actually get that. And if it's something that bugs you, you can just wear gloves if you have any gloves in your kitchen. So, um, I'm not sure I feel like wearing gloves. I'm just gonna get a little dermatitis today because I don't, whatever. Um, and then you're gonna peel your butternut squash and you have two choices for peeling your butternut squash. You can use a vegetable peeler and go over each area a few times. You basically wanna get it down to where it is totally orange and the rind is off. Or if you're a lazy cook like I am, you can just kind of take your knife and chop some off like that and you just want to get it down to like where it's not kind of white but it is orange i am a i am not i am a fast cook because when i finally get into the kitchen and it's time to cook i want to like get it done i'm not like micromanaging my peels life is too short for me for that so i'm gonna just hack the crap out of this butternut squash There you go. And then I'm gonna cut that in half. Definitely make sure your fingers are out of the way. Good time not to be drinking while you're doing this step. And then I'm just gonna chop that up into half inch rounds. One day, I wanna take like a knife cooking skills class. I know Culinary Institute of America has a course you can go take for like three weeks or a month and you basically just learn how to be a super proficient home chef. I think that would be really fun to do in the future. I bet we all have like 112 plans of things we're gonna do one day right now, right? Now I'm gonna, I stacked it up. You cannot stack it up that high if you're not feeling safe. And then I'm just cutting it into cubes and I'm gonna like zhuzh all that off of my cutting board. Zhuzh is a technical term. I really hope I don't like cut myself while I'm on camera right now. That would be classic. Classic move. So you can see I just got this one and a half inch cube and I am gonna continue doing that. And if any drops on the floor, you can just pick it up and rinse it off and slap it in the pan with everything else. You have to slap it, you can't place it, promise. There we go, gorgeous butternut squash. I'm not gonna cut the whole thing up right now because I think you guys know how to cut up a squash now. Um, I'm then gonna do some red onion 
and do that in a similar half inch chunk and peel it and peel it. I don't know if you guys have a compost. I have a compost, so all of this stuff will just go into my compost at the end here. We um, used to be Bella's job, my daughter, to take the compost out. And when she went to Spain on her um, gap year, <laughs> I remember like a week and a half after she left messaging her and being like, um, you need to come home and take out the compost because dad and I can't do it. It's your job. And now Max and I definitely take out the compost and I keep track of whose turn it is. He does not. That shows you who's more mature. That would be Lola. So after you get your whole butternut squash and two red onions on here, just take some olive oil, drizzle it on there again. I am super liberal with my olive oil. And then um, sprinkle on some salt and pepper if you want to. I use a um, French sea salt because I'm super bougie. And so I grind up that sea salt. You can just use any kosher salt or table salt. You do not need to have a mortar and pestle and pretty hand-blown glass jar to do this step. I was just showing off. So get some salt on there. I love salt. And then finally, the last step is to put on some sage. And you can use dried sage that's already ground. You can use fresh sage and chop that up. Or I have some dried whole leaf sage from my garden. So I just take that in my hand and I'm gonna take a few leaves and crush it up and sprinkle it all over. And it, your hands end up smelling so good. It's my favorite step, okay? I just kind of sprinkle it all over right there. And then I'm gonna to toss this a bit. And I forgot to tell you guys about my pan. You might notice that it seems like it's had a good long life. This pizza pan is from the Nines Pizzeria, which is no longer in operation in College Town. And my boyfriend, I think it was like 1993, 92, my boyfriend worked there, so we ate a lot of pizza and he brought home this pan, so we had it in our kitchen. And I think it was 93, there was a huge blizzard in Ithaca. All of Ithaca shut down. And um, Buffalo Street, which is this very steep street that goes up to College Town from downtown Buthick, um, Ithaca was closed and people were sledding down it. And I sledded down Buffalo Street in this here pan. Amazing, right? And now we use it constantly for roasting stuff because it's nice and thick. And um, it just has a really nice char to your veg. So I'm gonna slap this in the oven. I like saying slap with my cooking show. So clearly that's Lola, she's a little slap happy. So I just almost forgot something. I was about to put it in the oven. And if you want, this is optional. You can splash on a little bit of regular cider or hard cider. I've got some Redbird cider here. Um, you might have some leftover from last night's tasting if you were in Knit Ithaca and you wanna use that. I'm just going to splash on a tiny bit and what this is going to do is help everything caramelize and just add this like really sweet, um, I want to say the word umami because I've watched so many cooking shows that use the word umami and you know I designed something called the umami mitts and I've slapped that in there. It smells really good. This is going to go in the oven at 425 for at least 30 to 35 minutes if not a little longer. You want it to get like dark and charred and beautiful, stir it a few times, clean the kitchen while you're waiting for it, or um, call somebody else in your house in to clean the kitchen. And then we're gonna get ready to make the polenta cakes. Let's get this in the oven. Okay, let's get this in the oven. You guys can see my oven is not very clean. All right, let's make polenta cakes. I am getting my polenta out of the fridge. I am going to tell you guys that if I was a professional cooking show, I would have two of the same pans. This I made last night, ready to go for today. And um, it is cold, it's got its olive oil on the top. I'm gonna use a biscuit cutter because I have one and I know it's gonna make a great, perfect size round. You can use a glass if you don't have a biscuit cutter. You can like hand form, whatever you wanna do. It's really, don't get caught up in not having the right thing to be able to do this. Um, so I'm just gonna go on to the polenta and then I can just pick up a disc and I'm just putting them onto a cutting board. You can put them onto a plate. 
Um, it's so firm and perfect. If you've cooked the polenta long enough and it's had a little bit of time to chill, it is going to make a perfectly sized cake. The other thing that you can do with polenta like this is make polenta fries. And I'll find you guys a recipe for making polenta fries. So you can just cut this into strips if you want and then roast them in the oven and they're so good. You could maybe do this better than I did and, and um, get more in there and maybe not eat that one up with your hands the way I did. But you can also have some uneven shapes. It's okay for these not to be perfect. We are not, um, life is not perfect. There you go. Let's fry them up. The scraps are also really yummy. Mm. Okay guys, it is time to fry up these bad boys. I've got a cast iron pan and I'm turning on the heat underneath it. I have poured olive oil into it already because I'm so prepared today. And you want to get it hot, but not too, too hot. The goal is to try to fry up and brown both sides of the polenta cake. It doesn't always go smoothly. Don't worry too much about it. If they stick, they're going to taste amazing no matter what. I don't think I get props for being like the most aesthetically pleasing chef, but I think my food tastes good and that's the ultimate goal. So don't be too hard on yourself if things stick a little bit in this process. All right, I'm just warming it up, kind of doing the like feeling the heat. It is 32 degrees out today, so that actually feels very good. And I am gonna, oh yeah, you can start to hear a tiny bit of a sizzle. Not sure I'm gonna make this all on here with one batch, so I think I'm gonna do it in two batches. Oh yeah. Just kind of keep them moving. The goal is for them not to stick. So if you start to notice them stick, it might be that your pan's getting a little too hot, but keep them moving around. The moment that they start to stick is when the brown is gonna get left on the pan and not be on your polenta. So a little bit of zhuzhing. This one is being, I wonder if my stove's not even right there, so we'll kind of move around. Kind of keep them happening. There you go. You can see them kind of floating around. Yum. All right, guys, they're almost brown. I'm not going to do this too much longer. Um, Again, don't worry if, if they start sticking to the pan. Mine have clearly done that. They're still gonna taste amazing. So I'm gonna um, go grab a plate and plate up two of these so we can get on to the next step because they're gonna be so yummy. And I'm just gonna flip that over. I'm not quite sure why these didn't brown up as much as they should have, but there, see that one, the brown part stayed on the pan. This is cooking with Lola right here. It is not quite going as anticipated. I tested this and it went great. So I think you guys are gonna be fine. So I'm just gonna put a few cakes on. Again, yours are probably gonna come out browner than mine are. And we are gonna go put some topping on them, okay? Mm. Okay, you guys, I know my polenta cakes don't look as amazing as they could. I'm sure yours are gonna look better than mine. When I tested this recipe twice, they browned. So, you know, the gods are not with Lola right now. So I am just opening up some goat cheese here. What I like to do with this goat cheese, cause it comes in these logs, is open it up with a pair of scissors and I just put it into a little um, glass Pyrex dish that has a lid. And then we have the goat cheese to eat and um, it's not as messy as trying to get it out of the plastic log. So there, that's my trick for goat cheese. Pretty fancy, I know. Ah, it's a mess in here now. So what I'm gonna do is take some of this roasted butternut squash and onion mixture and put that on top. 
You can put on as much or as little as you want. I'm gonna really like load it on there because I like my vegetables a lot. And then I'm gonna sprinkle on some Aleppo pepper. And um, if you want, you can drizzle on some um, balsamic vinegar. You can also, if you have like roasted pumpkin oil, that's normally what I would put on here and we actually ate all of ours or used it all. And then grab some of your pepitas. If you have some, if, um, if you got your Knit Ithaca kit, you actually got some pepitas in your kit. And luckily I've got my scissors handy to open those up. Sprinkle on some pepitas, as many as you'd like. And then there, I just picked up a piece of goat cheese from the counter. Just crumble on a little bit of goat cheese. This is like a full on meal we have happening here. Okay, now it's time to try it. Yum, I'm so excited. Mm. So the polenta cakes are salty and then the topping. Mm. I'm gonna make really happy noises and talk while I eat. So you guys go ahead and make this. Ask me any questions. I am excited to be cooking with you. This is really fun. This is one thing you can do with polenta cakes. You can also put like tomato sauce and some Parmesan cheese on there. You could do pesto sauce. You could put eggs and like caramelized onions. The polenta cakes just end up being like a, a blank canvas for whatever you find in your fridge that you want to put on there. I'm just really drawn to ro roasted vegetables. You could probably do like some kind of um, meat and Brussels sprouts thing if that's your thing, if you feel like you need to like throw some meat into your meal. Um, the other thing you can make, I mentioned earlier, are polenta fries with your polenta. So there's a lot you can do with the bag of polenta. Have a great time playing with it and let's all share some recipes. This is super fun. Time for more cooking shows, I think. Happy eating.